Hi everyone, this lecture is on chapter 21. We're going to talk about fluids, electrolytes, and acid-base balance. So let's start with the overview and that balance concept. Water and electrolytes are interdependent in the body. A change in one causes a change in the other. Electrolytes, called ions, are dissolved in water. The most important electrolytes are sodium, potassium, calcium, hydrogen, hydroxide, chloride, and magnesium. Homeostasis requires that amounts of water and electrolytes that enter the body equal the amounts exiting. Balance is maintained by mechanisms that replace lost water and electrolytes and excrete excesses. The distribution of body fluids is not uniformly distributed. Body fluids occupy compartments of different volumes containing various compositions. Water and electrolyte movement between these compartments is regulated to stabilize their distribution and the composition of body fluids. The average adult female is about 52% water by weight, and the average adult male is about 63% water by weight. And this is because females have more adipose tissue, which is low in water, and males have more muscle, which is high in water. There are about 40 liters of water with dissolved electrolytes in the body and they are distributed into two major compartments, the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid. The intracellular fluid is the fluid found inside cells, and the extracellular fluid is the fluid found outside cells. This illustration shows the intracellular and extracellular fluid ratios. The intracellular fluid takes up about 63%, and that's what's inside the cells, and the extracellular fluid takes up about 37%, which is what's outside the cells. So I like to remember it in uh, two-thirds intracellular fluid to one-third extracellular fluid ratio. The intracellular fluid compartment is all the water and electrolytes found inside the cell membranes, and that's 63% of the body's water. The extracellular fluid compartment contains 37% of the body's water and it consists of various fluid outside cells, such as interstitial fluid, blood plasma, lymph, and transcellular fluid. Interstitial fluid is found in tissue spaces, blood plasma is found in blood vessels, lymph is found in lymphatic vessels, and transcellular fluid is separated from other extracellular fluids by epithelial layers and consists of cerebrospinal fluid, aqueous and vitreous humors in the eye, the synovial fluid in the joints, and serous fluid. I'm so glad that they mentioned that because that's not usual to see transcellular fluid grouped in with interstitial fluid, blood plasma, and lymph, but it is a very important watery environment. So here we see the intracellular fluid is 63% that's inside the cells, and the extracellular fluid is 37%, and we've got our interstitial fluid, and then our plasma, our lymph, and our transcellular fluid that's found in like our, in our cavities. All right, the body fluid composition and movement of fluids between compartments. Body fluids are solutions of electrolytes in water. Extracellular fluids are all similar in composition and they have high concentrations of sodium, chloride, calcium, and bicarbonate ions. Blood plasma contains more proteins than interstitial fluid or lymph. Intracellular fluid has high concentrations of potassium, magnesium, phosphate, and sulfur oxide ions. And sulfate, my apologies. The movement of fluid between compartments. There are two major factors that regulate the movement of fluid from one compartment to another and that is hydrostatic pressure and osmotic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure remains equal and stable in cells and interstitial fluids. Osmotic pressure is exerted by impermeant solutes, and most fluid movement results from changes in osmotic pressure. Here we see the body fluid composition of the extracellular fluid versus the intracellular fluid. So we see that in the extracellular fluid, we have higher amounts of sodium, so that's the outside of the cell, and we have higher amounts of chloride. In the intracellular fluid, we have higher amounts of potassium and magnesium and phosphate. 
and this affects the movement of fluid between compartments. In step one, fluid leaves the plasma at arteriolar ends of capillaries because the outward force of hydrostatic pressure predominates. In step two, fluid returns to the plasma at the venular ends of the capillaries because the inward force of colloid osmotic pressure predominates. In step three, hydrostatic pressure within interstitial spaces forces fluid into lymph capillaries. And in step four, interstitial fluid is in equilibrium with transcellular and intracellular fluids. Now let's talk about water balance. Water balance exists when water intake and metabolic production equals water output. Control of both water intake and output required for homeostasis. Water intake is controlled by the thirst centers in the brain and water output is controlled by the kidneys. With water intake, the daily amount varies among individuals. It averages about 2,500 milliliters daily for an adult. 60% comes from drinking fluids and 30% comes from moist foods. 10% is a byproduct of oxidative metabolism of nutrients called water of metabolism. Water output should also be about 2,500 milliliters a day, which is equal to water intake. Water can be lost by a variety of methods. 60% is lost in urine, 6% is lost in feces, 6% is lost in sweat as sensible perspiration, and 28% is lost through a combination of evaporation from skin, insensible perspiration, and from the lungs during breathing. Water output varies with temperature, humidity, and activity level. Water output can be adjusted if intake is changed. This table shows the water intake and output. Um, figure A shows the average daily intake with the water and beverages being 60%, water and moist food being 30%, and metabolic water being 10%. And that total intake is 2,500 milliliters. And then with the output of water, we see that water is lost in the urine is 60%. Water is lost through the skin and the lungs is 28%. Water is lost in the feces is 6%, and water lost in the sweat is 6%. Thirst is the primary regulator of water intake. Thirst sensation is derived from a change in volume or osmotic pressure of extracellular fluids, abbreviated ECF. The osmotic pressure is due to the presence of impermeant solutes, which cannot cross the cell membrane. Osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus detect changes in osmotic pressure of body fluids. The response to loss of 1% of body water, the osmoreceptors detect an increase in osmotic pressure and stimulate the thirst mechanism. Stretch receptors in blood vessels detect water loss due to hemorrhage and stimulate thirst center. A decrease in the blood pressure activates the renin-angiotensin system. Angiotensin II stimulates the thirst center. Drinking fluids results in stomach distension, which inhibits the thirst center. Uh, this table 21.1 summarizes the regulation of water intake. Regulation of water output. Distal tubules and collecting ducts of kidney are effectors of mechanisms that control amount of water excreted in urine. Distal tubules and collecting ducts are impermeable to water, except in the presence of antidiuretic hormone. The osmoreceptor antidiuretic hormone mechanism in the hypothalamus regulates the concentration of urine produced in the kidney. During dehydration, excess water loss causes osmoreceptors to lose water and shrink. This stimulates antidiuretic hormone secretion. Antidiuretic hormone increases the permeability of renal distal tubules and collecting ducts to water. This increases the reabsorption and conservation of water. After drinking excess water, Excess water intake causes osmoreceptors to swell. Antidiuretic hormone is inhibited. Distal tubules and collecting ducts are impermeable to water. Water reabsorption decreases and urine volume increases. Table 21.2 summarizes the events in the regulation of water output. In a clinical ap application, it talks about water balance disorders. We have dehydration, hypotonic hydration or water intoxication, and edema. 
Dehydration is a water deficiency in which output exceeds intake. Extracellular fluid becomes concentrated and hydrogen, oh, sorry, water, <laughs> H2O, leaves cells by osmosis. Wastes accumulate in extracellular fluid, leading to nervous system issues. Temperature regulation mechanisms can fail due to the lack of water for sweating, resulting in hyperthermia. In hypotonic hydration or water intoxication, excess fluid can intake can result in hyponatremia, which is low blood level of sodium. This creates an imbalance between water and electrolytes. Edema is an abnormal accumulation of extracellular fluid in the interstitial spaces. It's caused by a decrease in plasma proteins, obstruction in lymphatic vessels, increased capillary permeability or venous pressure, and inflammation. Electrolyte balance exists when amounts of electrolytes gained by the body gains equal those lost. Kidneys change the amount of electrolytes excreted in urine to keep body fluid composition in homeostasis. Electrolyte intake is the most important electrolytes for cellular function such as sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, chloride, sulfate, phosphate, bicarbonate, and hydrogen. So the sources of electrolytes for electrolyte intake are obtained mainly from foods, some are from water and other beverages, and some are byproducts of metabolism. In the regulation of electrolyte intake, usually electrolyte intake is insufficient, or is sufficient, by responding to hunger and thirst. Severe electrolyte deficiency may cause a salt craving. The methods of electrolyte output. The greatest electrolyte output is through urine production. Kidneys adjust electrolyte losses in the urine. They regulate the composition of body fluids and maintain homeostasis. Some electrolytes are lost in sweating, as perspiring, and more are lost during perspiring on warmer days and during strenuous exercise. And some electrolytes are lost in the feces. Concentrations of positively charged ions, such as sodium, potassium, and calcium, are of particular importance. They are vital for nerve cell impulse conduction, muscle fiber contraction, and maintenance of cell membrane permeability. Potassium ions maintains the resting potential in nerve and cardiac muscle cells, and sodium ions account for almost 90% of positively charged ions in extracellular fluids. Aldosterone is a hormone that regulates both sodium and potassium ion concentrations. High potassium concentration stimulates the secretion of aldosterone, which increases tubular reabsorption of sodium and tubular secretion of potassium. A decrease in plasma calcium levels stimulates the secretion of parathyroid hormone, which causes an increase in the plasma calcium level. Some negative ions, such as chloride, are transported along with positive ions, such as sodium. Figure 21.6 illustrates electrolyte balance coming from foods, fluid, and metabolic reactions gives us our electrolyte intake, and our electrolyte output goes from perspiration, feces, and urine. Figures 21.7 and 21.8 show the regulation of electrolyte output and how um, the plasma potassium ion concentration increases, causing the adrenal cortex to secrete aldosterone into the bloodstream. The renal tubules increase reabsorption of sodium ions, and they increase the secretion of potassium ions. Sodium ions are conserved, and potassium ions are excreted in urine, and we can see a uh, Negative feedback loop in the next uh, figure here in 21.8 that you're welcome to review. In the clinical application, 21.2, it talks about sodium and potassium imbalances. And you can see that um, they kind of relate to the water imbalances. So hyponatremia is low blood sodium concentration. And it's caused by prolonged sweating, vomiting, and drinking too much water. The effects are hypotonic extracellular fluid and the uptake of water by cells by osmosis. Hypernatremia is high blood sodium concentration. It's caused by excess water loss as in fever or diabetes insipidus. The effects are central nervous system disturbances, confusion, stupor, and coma. Hypokalemia is low blood potassium concentration. This is caused by some diuretics, kidney disease, and a decrease in extracellular hydrogen ions. The effects are muscle weakness or paralysis, cardiac disturbances, and breathing problems. 
Hyperkalemia is high blood potassium concentration. It's caused by renal disease and aldosterone deficiency. And the effects are skeletal muscle paralysis and cardiac disturbances. Now let's talk about acid-base balance. Acids are electrolytes that ionize in water and release hydrogen ions. Bases are substances which release ions that combine with hydrogen ions and therefore lower their concentration in body fluids. The acid-base balance involves regulation of hydrogen ion concentrations in body fluids. This is important because slight changes in hydrogen ion concentration can alter the rates of enzyme-controlled metabolic reactions, shift the distribution of other ions, or alter hormone actions. pH number indicates the degree to which a solution is acidic or basic, which is also known as alkaline. The more acidic the solution, the lower its pH. The more basic or alkaline the solution, the higher its pH. Normal pH of internal environment is 7.35 to 7.45. Most hydrogen ions are byproducts of metabolic reactions, but digestive tract absorbs some. Figure 21.9 shows sources of hydrogen ions. Carbonic acid from aerobic respiration of glucose. Lactic acid from the anaerobic respiration of glucose. Acidic ketone bodies from the incomplete oxidation of fatty acids. Sulfuric acid from the oxidation of sulfur-containing amino acids. And phosphoric acid from the hydrolysis of phosphoproteins and nucleic acids. So notice that um, each thing that contributes to hydrogen ions in the environment are acids. That's what acids do. They donate hydrogen ions to the environment. So strong acids ionize more completely and release more hydrogen ions. For example, the hydrochloric acid in gastric juice. Weak acids ionize less completely and release fewer hydrogen ions. Examples are carbonic acid, which is produced when carbon dioxide combines with water. We talked about that in uh, the last or in the chapters with um, probably the respiratory system because we were talking about how bicarbonate carries um, carbon dioxide to the lungs for excretion and we went through the buffering equation which I'm sure we'll go through again here. Strong bases now is what we're going to talk about. So strong bases ionize more completely and release more hydroxide or other negatively charged ions that combine with hydrogen ions. For example, sodium hydroxide. Weak bases ionize less completely and release fewer hydroxide ions or other negative ions. Examples are sodium bicarbonate and bicarbonate can act as a base in this in this time. So either a shift or an acid shift or an alkaline or basic shift in the body fluids could endanger the internal environment. Remember the um Homeostasis was a pH of 7.35 to 7.45. And that's where it has to stay. Normal metabolic reactions generally produce more acid than base. For example, cellular metabolism of glucose, fatty acids, and amino acids. Thus, the maintenance of acid-base balance usually eliminates acids in one of three ways. The chemical buffer systems, the respiratory excretion of carbon dioxide, and the renal excretion of hydrogen ions. Yay, there's the um, equation uh, that we were talking about earlier. So the chemical buffer systems are in all body fluids and are based on chemicals that combine with excess acids or bases. Buffers are substances that stabilize the pH of a solution even when an acid or base is added. Buffers minimize pH changes in body fluids. Buffer components combine with strong acids to convert them to weak acids and with strong bases to convert them to weak bases. The bicarbonate buffer system is found in the intracellular and extracellular fluids. The bicarbonate ion acts as a weak base and converts a strong acid to a weak acid. Carbonic acid acts as a weak acid and converts a strong base to a weak base. And remember the equation is hydrogen plus bicarbonate um, yields carbonic acid and this can go left to right as needed. And um, we saw a little bit more to the equation where it had the water and all that in it in the last chapter. So if conditions are acidic, the reaction proceeds towards the right and hydrogen ions are taken up. If the conditions are basic, the reaction 
proceeds towards the left and hydrogen ions are released. So this is a real nice succinct um, equation here to show that uh, reaction to the right is going to take up hydrogen ions because we've got too many ions so we're going to convert into bicarbonate and then if conditions are basic we're going to shift over to the left and we're going to release hydrogen ions into the system. Then we have a couple of other buffer systems the phosphate buffer system and the protein buffer system. So the phosphate buffer system is found in intracellular and extracellular fluids it is important in intracellular fluid, the renal tubular fluid, and urine. Monohydrogen phosphate ion, HPO4, 2 negative, meaning it has um, gained two electrons, acts as a weak base in the presence of excess hydrogen ions, and it binds to form dihydrogen phosphate which minimizes the increase in free hydrogen ions. So the dihydrogen phosphate ion acts as a weak acid in alkaline fluids. It releases hydrogen ions to turn conditions more acidic. Acidic conditions cause the reaction to proceed towards the right, binding hydrogen ions. Basic conditions shift the reaction towards the left, releasing hydrogen ions. So again, this is important in intracellular fluids, so inside the cell, inside the renal tubules, so um, like the nephrons and urine. Then we see the protein buffer system. This consists of plasma proteins known as albumin, also hemoglobin and certain cell proteins. Nitrate and acid groups buffer acidity or alkalinity by accepting or releasing hydrogen ions. And so those are part of the amino acids. So the amino group is the NH2 and the COOH is the acid group. The hemoglobin buffers hydrogen ions in the blood by temporarily binding to them as they travel in venous blood. Table 21.3 summarizes the chemical acid base buffer systems. The one I'm most familiar with is the bicarbonate um, system because we talk about that with um, respiratory and renal compensation. So let's take a look at the respiratory excretion of carbon dioxide. The respiratory center is located in the brain stem and it helps regulate hydrogen ion concentrations in body fluids by controlling the rate and depth of breathing. Increased production of carbon dioxide by body cells leads to the formation of carbonic acid which then dissociates into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate. The increase in free hydrogen ions lowers the pH in the body fluids. So here's the um, equation that we did see in the respiratory system. So we have the whole thing here with the water and all. And so we can see that carbon dioxide plus water yields um, carbonic acid. And then carbonic acid can weakly dissociate into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate. And so in response to increased acidity, the respiratory center increases the rate and depth of breathing. So as the hydrogen ions and the carbon dioxide build up, remember earlier in the respiratory system it said that like carbon dioxide basically is equal to hydrogen ions um, concerning that medulla oblongata. All right, so cells increase the production of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide reacts with water to produce carbonic acid. Carbonic acid releases hydrogen ions. The respiratory center in the medulla oblongata is stimulated. The rate and the depth of breathing increase and more carbon dioxide is excreted through the lungs. <sighs> Look at that. Renal excretion of hydrogen ions. Um, so the nephrons help regulate the hydrogen ion concentration of body fluids by excreting excess hydrogen ions in the urine. Hydrogen ions are added into the renal tubules by tubular secretion. Hydrogen ion secretion is linked to tubular reabsorption of bicarbonate ions. When acids appear in the body fluids as a result of metabolic processes, reabsorbed bicarbonate ions bind free hydrogen ions and form whew, carbonic acid. <laughs> My brain is having to read all of these chemical um, symbols. So thank you for dealing with me. It's doing its best. 
All right, so this buffering mechanism prevents body fluids from becoming too acidic. Breakdown of certain amino acids produces phosphoric or sulfuric acid. So a high protein diet can produce excess acids. Kidneys compensate for extra acidity by increasing tubular secretion of hydrogen ions and e increased excretion in the urine. So here we see in figure 21.11, the renal excretion of hydrogen ions. So a high intake of proteins can increase metabolism of the amino acids. And this increases the formation of sulfuric acid and phosphoric acid. This increases the concentration of hydrogen ions in body fluids. This increased secretion of hydrogen ions goes into the fluid of the renal tubules. And then increased excretion of hydrogen ions in the urine occurs. And the concentration of hydrogen ions in the body fluids return to normal. So between the respiratory system uh, and excretion of carbon dioxide and the renal excretion of hydrogen ions, those are two very important systems to um, maintain that acid-base homeostasis. Remember, we have to be a pH of 7.35 to 7.45. And if we um, can't do that, then we have... Um, disease and so we'll probably get into that in a minute I saw it later when they were talking about uh, compensation so let's hang tight all right so the various regulators of the hydrogen ion concentrations function at different rates so acid base or chemical buffers function rapidly almost immediately and this converts strong acids or bases to weak acids or bases it's the first line of defense against pH changes the physiological buffers which are the respiratory and renal mechanisms function more slowly. The respiratory takes just minutes, but the renal takes one to three days. And this is the second line of defense against the pH changes. So the first line of defense against the pH shift is chemical buffer system. So that's our bicarbonate buffer system and our phosphate buffer system and protein buffer system. I'm glad to know about all three of those. Like I said, we normally just focus on that bicarbonate. This is a good book, y'all. Um, and then the second line of defense against the pH shift is the physiological buffers, which are the respiratory mechanism of carbon dioxide excretion and the renal mechanism of hydrogen ion excretion, which are two very tried and true um, pot materials. Uh, when you get to nursing, you're going to do your RBGs, your respiratory blood gases, and um, those are going to be huge. And so this is what results if we have this acid-base imbalance, and this is why it's so important to um, maintain you know, respiratory health and renal health in your patients. So chemical and physiological buffer systems usually maintain the hydrogen ion concentration of body fluids within a very narrow pH range of 7.35 to 7.45 in arterial blood. Um, yeah, arterial blood gases. I think earlier I said RBGs. That's right. Anyway, <laughs> red blood gases, arterial blood gases, ABGs. So abnormal conditions may disturb the acid-base balance. Acidemia is a pH below 7.35, and the condition is called acidosis. And this is caused by an accumulation of acids or a loss of bases, and it increases the hydrogen ion concentrations in the body fluid. And this can result from um, ketosis uh, and a lot of times like diabetic ketosis, and that's what can lead to diabetic coma because acidemia will shut down the nervous system. Alkalemia is much rarer. It's a pH above 7.45, and it's a condition called alkalosis. And it's caused by the accumulation of bases or the loss of acids. A decrease in the hydrogen ion concentration in body fluids results. And so this one is, um, like I said, less common. It can be from, you know, excess vomiting, excess anti-acid usage. Um, but uh, it is going to generally cause, like, more excitement to the nervous system. Tremors and seizuring and stuff like that. All right, so acid-base imbalances are called respiratory if it's caused by a respiratory problem, such as COPD, and metabolic if it's caused by another type of disturbance, such as the diabetic ketosis I mentioned. Uh, so this shows the survival range. So anything under 6.8 pH is death. Anything above 8.0 pH is death. But look at that little narrow range. 7.35 to 7.45 is where you want to be. Anything below that is acidosis. Anything above that is alkalosis. Uh, and so here we see the causes, accumulation of acids or the loss of bases um, are going to lead to the increased concentration of hydrogen ions. And that is going to cause a drop in the pH, which leads to acidosis. 
So pH is the inverse scale. The lower the pH, the more hydrogen ions there are. And so an acid has a low pH, y'all, 1 to 6.9. Well, 0 to 6.9, really. All right? And then for the uh, base, uh, having alkalosis results from the loss of acids or the accumulation of bases. So again, vomiting, you know, you're vomiting stomach acid out or you're having diarrhea um, or an accumulation of bases, you're taking too many antacids. Um, and that can cause a decreased concentration of hydrogen ion. The pH thus rises, and then we have alkalosis. So a high pH is going to have less hydrogen ion concentrations in it. So anything from like a 7.1 to a 14. And so notice that the normal level of blood pH is actually slightly basic, um, but it's close enough that we call it circumneutral. Okay, so now we get to talk in more depth about the two major types of acidosis, and they are going to be way more common than the alkalosis. And so respiratory acidosis is caused by an increase in carbon dioxide and carbonic acid levels in the blood. It may include respiratory insufficiency, such as labored breathing and cyanosis, which is blue skin and mouth. The causes are injury to the respiratory centers in the brainstem, the obstruction of air passages, or diseases that hinder gas exchange, like COPD. And metabolic acidosis is caused by the accumulation of other acids or the loss of bases. And the cause would be di kidney disease with decreased ability to excrete acids, prolonged diarrhea, or diabetes mellitus, in which acid ketones are produced. Symptoms of acidosis uh, are derived from reduced functioning of the central nervous system and its drowsiness, disorientation, stupor, and cyanosis. So we see the three causes of acidosis on the left, decreased rate of depth in breathing, obstruction of air passages, and decreased gas exchange. This leads to the accumulation of carbon dioxide and respiratory acidosis. And then for metabolic acidosis, we see the kidney fails to excrete acids or an excessive production of acidic ketones, as in diabetes mellitus. This causes the accumulation of non-respiratory acids, metabolic acidosis, um, and then we see at the um, bottom here the um, other thing that causes metabolic acidosis, which is the excessive loss of bases. And that's prolonged diarrhea with the loss of alkaline intestinal secretions and then prolonged vomiting with loss of intestinal secretions. So I think earlier I said that um, alkalosis might be caused by excessive diarrhea. I apologize. I retract that. It's, um, let's just stick with vomiting for uh, alkalosis. Another thing that I understand, though, and again, hope I'm not lying to you, but um, is that alcoholism can cause acidosis as well, uh, considering alcohol is acidic and it messes with um, the kidneys. Okay, so now let's look at the alkalosis so we get the whole picture. So respiratory alkalosis is caused by the excess loss of carb uh, carbon dioxide and carbonic acid. It results from hyperventilation due to anxiety, fever, poisoning, high altitude breathing, and playing musical instruments. <laughs> uh, and then metabolic alkalosis results from the excess loss of hydrogen ions or the accumulation of bases. And so here's our gastric drainage, vomiting, as I mentioned earlier, diuretics, and taking excess antacids. So don't think about diarrhea with alkalosis. Let's stick with uh, just vomiting for alkalosis. Neither are fun. All right, symptoms of alkalosis is agitation, dizziness, lightheadedness, and tingling, and tectonic muscle contractions in severe cases. Like I said, seizuring. So here we see um, on the left, anxiety, fear, poisoning, and high altitude sickness can cause hyperventilation, which is the excessive loss of carbon dioxide, a decrease in the concentration of carbonic acid, and a decrease in the concentration of hydrogen ions, leading to respiratory alkalosis. And then for metabolic acid, uh, alkalosis, remember we have two things. We have like a loss of acids and a gain of bases. So at the top, it shows gastric drainage, vomiting with the loss of gastric secretions and certain diuretics lead to the loss of non-respiratory acids, which can lead to metabolic acidosis. And then at the bottom, it says excess ingestion or administration of antacids can cause the gain of bases, which can lead to metabolic acidosis. So compensation. Compensation is the resistance to a pH shift during an acid-base imbalance. It is accomplished by changes in the actions of various chemical buffers 
respiratory carbon dioxide excretion and renal hydrogen ion excretion. For example, compensation for metabolic alkalosis due to excess and acids, the chemical buffers will release hydrogen ions into the pH. The rate and depth of breathing decreases, retaining carbon dioxide and lowering pH. Kidneys decrease tubular secretion of hydrogen ions retaining them. Another example is the compensation for respiratory acidosis due to pulmonary disease. The chemical buffers will bind hydrogen ions to remove them from body fluids. The respiratory system is unable to help with compensation in this case. Bummer. An increased hydrogen ion secretion in the kidneys and an increasing excretion from the urine. Yeah, if you've got pulmonary disease and you're not breathing, there's no way the respiratory system can help with that. Oh, so we don't have any life changes this time. Um, I guess uh, just... Make sure you can maintain your homeostasis and uh, live a long, healthy life and have a wonderful day, everybody.